Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Harriet Beecher Stowe House online and for our presentation today. My name is Christina Hartlieb and I'm the director here at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. And we do a lot of discussions and groups, uh, discussion groups and lectures, but this is really exciting in terms of offering a practical info and skills type session for researchers. So I'd like to extend to everyone here, as long as you're in Cincinnati, uh, an invitation to our next in-person big event, which will be Harriet's birthday party on Sunday, June 13th from one to four outside at the Harry Beecher Stowe House. And our rain date, if we do have to postpone, our rain date will be the following Saturday, which is Juneteenth. Please check out our website for additional online and in-person events, and we will be adding more walking tours for the summer of our abolitionist and African-American walking tour of Walnut Hills. Also, I did send copies of the resource handout earlier today via the Friends of Harriet Beecher Stowe House email. So if you haven't received it, and if you registered today, you probably just got it like 10 minutes ago. But if you haven't received it yet, just put that in the chat that you still need that and we will get it to you. Um, you can also put any questions in the chat while Thomas is presenting and then I will kind of moderate and pull all those together uh, for him at the end of his presentation. But then we should also have some time for discussions and questions, you know, amongst ourselves, you know, real time on camera, etc. Uh, at the end as well. So now I would like to start the presentation part. Uh, Thomas Jordan is our, a board member of the Friends of Harry Beecher Stowe House. He's also president of the African American Genealogy Group of the Miami Valley. He's the author of Double Jordan, My Journey Towards Discovering My Paternal Ancestors. So I wanna thank Thomas for being with us today. And if you wanna leave yourself on mute during the presentation and we will let him do all of the great talking and he's going to share some information on the screen with us as well. So Thomas, take it away. Hello everyone and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we had a new lease on life with the uh, restrictions being dropped on the pandemic. So everybody's got cabin fever and outside. And so uh, that was partly why this is not in the 200s <laughs> in terms of attendance. Um, but again, taking your time out on a Sunday afternoon, it's kind of cloudy here in Cincinnati, um, but just thankful for all of you that have joined us and are here this afternoon and uh, just kind of sharing with you um, a little bit about African-American genealogy and a little bit of our journey along the way and uh, give you some keys to success that we've uh, found helpful uh, over the last now going on 13 years and five years since we published our book. I want to thank Christina and the Harriet Beecher Stowe House for having us and Catherine Gibbons, um, president of our board, and uh, truly an honor. And uh, I see, as I'm looking at all the participants, um, I am, see, oh my gosh, I'm now, I'm really under pressure now because I see the doctor and the queen of Cleveland, Dr. Deborah Abbott up there, and J. Mark Lowe, uh, who I will, and on your handout, I have mentioned um, in terms of genealogists you need to know. So I'm glad to have them, my friends, and uh, look up to them dearly. And so this is, so when you see those two, this is not spam, this is caviar when you see those two join us. So we're going to get started. I'm going to attempt to do this right. Share our screen. And if you, Christina, you see it? All right. Let me go back up here. A slide here. Uh, this is African American Genealogy 101. Um, and for the friends, on behalf of the friends of Harriet Beecher Stowe House, Cincinnati, Ohio, May 16th, 2021. And this is my scripture for genealogy, God set up the solitary in families. And my wife and I have been discussing what I want on my tombstone, when and if that happens, but I'd like to put that on my tombstone because I truly love my family. Um, 
And starting off, uh, my mom, I think, is on this uh, Zoom conference. She's watching with my daughter. I want to honor these two ladies. The lady on the left you see is my mother, Leela Beatrice Thomas Jordan. Her maiden name is Thomas. That's where I got my first name. And this young lady, this is a uh, not a recent picture, picture, older picture, but she just turned 90 years young in October. And I am all that I am because of my mother. So I'm glad to have her with us uh, in person and have her on this side of the, uh, uh, we say on the side of the dirt. And um, she knows when she's talking and I take my phone out, I'm taking notes on what she's telling me. The lady on the right is my aunt, Helen Thomas, my aunt by marriage. She's married to my mother's brother, Lonnie Lorenzo Dennis Thomas. We call him Uncle Lonnie. She is 101 years old, going to be 102 in July. She resides in my mother's native state of Mississippi, uh, specifically Lauderdale County, Meridian, Mississippi. And um, if any of my family from Mississippi is on, I want to honor her and uh, love her, appreciate her, glad that she's still around. This gentleman on on the screen right now is Art Thomas of Springfield, Ohio. I want to honor him. He's one of the founders of the African American Genealogy Group of the Miami Valley. Art is a, a only he's the only person of only kind. Uh, he uh, he's phenomenal. He is forgotten more than we know. And Art recently, when I make this initial slide, he became a member, charter member of the Society of the Families of the Old Northwest Territory in conjunction with the Ohio Genealogical Society. And this means his ancestors were in the area that became Ohio by 1781, seven years prior to the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And if you think about it in terms of African-American history, and genealogy, this is a phenomenal achievement for him to have documented this and provided proof to become a part of this organization. Um, and in memoriam, this is um, on the left, uh, my cousin Felix Wilder and my cousin Peggy Jordan, they resided in Dunbar, south, a section of South Charleston, West Virginia. And when I really intensely started this journey some 13 years ago, um, the Lord opened a way for me to contact him. Um, he was cordial, invited us down for a weekend in September of 2008, and my life has not been the same since. Felix is my first cousin once removed. He is the son of my grandmother's sister, Maddie Bell Jordan Wilder. He told us everything he could about my mother, uh, about my grandmother, uh, Clara Jordan, and anything he could remember about his grandmother, my grandmother's mother, Ella Webb Jordan. And that led us to uh, make our first trip to my father's home state of Georgia, and specifically Crawford County, Georgia, uh, Roberta, Georgia, where my father's from. And again, my life has not been the same. And pictured with him is my cousin, Peggy Jordan. I never knew she existed. Her father was my grandmother's brother. Um, he died at a young, uh, when she was a child, and if you see pictures of my grandmother, they look like twins. So that led me to Roberta, Georgia. Uh, the picture on the right is the headstone of my two times great great grandfather, Jesse Jordan Sr., born in 1817, died in 1915. That is a Jordan Grove um, uh, cemetery in Roberta, Crawford County, Georgia, where a lot of my relatives are, are, are interred. And once again, if it had not been for Felix, and uh, who's deceased now, he died a couple of years ago, sharing with me the information that he had, I would have never made it to Georgia and, and had my question answered. Do I have any relatives left in Georgia? This is my, and this led to the book, my book, Double Jordan, My Journey Towards Discovering My Paternal Ancestors, written about five years ago. I've got to update it, I've got to uh, tweak it, add some stuff in it, um, because the journey continues. I've discovered more ancestors on my father's side since this book was written. On the front cover are my paternal grandparents, Willie Jordan on the left and Clara Jordan on the right. And an awesome memoriam. We just, we just had a tough stretch here in the last four months. My uh, wife has lost three aunts in the last four months. All of them made it to their 90s. And so we want to honor Bernice Valentine Marshall, better known as Aunt Byrne, 1929 to 2021. Again, my wife's paternal aunt, my wife's father's sisters. Mary Valentine Thomas, also known as TT, 
Uh, if you hang around us, everybody in my family's got a nickname. So this is Aunt TT, born in 1924. She passed away in March of this year, 2021. And last but not least, this really was hurtful. Uh, we just buried her aunt on Friday, Gladys, my wife's aunt, Gladys Helen Valentine Berry, better known as Aunt Goodney, 1926 to 2021. And uh, they all shared information with us. My wife will tell you that I know more about her family than she does. And all of them at points in time shared what they could with us over the last few years uh, on this journey about my, not only my family, but Jackie's family. And this is my cousin, Gloria Garner, better known as Pee Wee. She unexpectedly passed um, uh, last month, like April this year, 1944, 2021. Again, my paternal, my, actually, that's an error, so my maternal first cousin. Um, again, she shared information with me, knowing what, what I was doing, didn't second guess. She just shared what we had, she had with us, and uh, we are gonna sorely miss her. And this proves the, after, as we, Again, yeah, talk about African American genealogy 101. When an old man dies, a library burns to the ground. That's an old African proverb. So our goals for today are to look at the unique challenges in genealogical research as it pertains to people of color, known in present day as African American. We're gonna introduce you to some resources that will enhance your research and briefly look at some of the complexities involved in slave research. Those of you who have registered, you received a handout, and you're going to find real soon, uh, real quickly, that I like to read. I'm a voracious reader. Uh, I almost put my whole personal library on the resource uh, handout that we gave you, but I couldn't do that. So but I put on there all the books that I'm going to mention throughout this presentation and some books I think will help you get started if you're just beginning genealogy. And there's a little bit of an intermediate involved in this uh, past the beginner stage, but I hope it will be a blessing to you and you will find the resources you need. So let's play true or false. African American Genealogy 101. Let's play true or false. If I was one with you in a room setting, I could give you some time to answer, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put these up quickly um, and think about the questions. Number one, African American genealogy research is the same as normal genealogy research until you go back beyond the 1870 census. This is partially true. And the reason is, let me step back. When you're doing, take off the, the moniker African-American, just do genealogy period, the principles are the same, the rules are the same, the um, systems are the same in terms of researching your ancestors. But there is a difference because of our experience, just like there is a difference from the experiences with people who are of Jewish ancestry Italian ancestry, Latino ancestry. And so this is a quote from Tony Burroughs, to say black genealogy is the same as traditional genealogy back to the Civil War also negates at the time of his, when he wrote his book, Black Roots, 135 years of African history, racism, segregation, and discrimination in America. These things affect genealogy just as they affect history. And that's from Tony Burroughs, author of Black Roots. I'll make a mention of his book here in a minute. Next question. All people of color prior to the Emancipation Proclamation were slaves. The answer is false. Many people, many people do not realize, and I'm thinking of two sections of the country right now, Baltimore, Maryland, where my wife's paternal grandfather is from, and also Danville, Kentucky, which I know Dr. Abbott has done extensive research in, um, but Danville, Kentucky, where my mother, my wife's patern um, paternal grandmother is from, there is a large population of what we call free people of color in those cities. So when you're doing research, a lot of people just automatically assume that all of our ancestors prior to the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation in 1865 were enslaved and that's not true. And that will affect how you're going about searching your ancestors. So here's a book, Free African Americans of North Carolina and Virginia, Paul Heineck. And another book I told you I'd like to read, Slaves Without Masters, The Free Negro, in the antebellum South, Ira Berlin. And these books are on your handout. Next question, all or most African-Americans have Native American blood in them. If you are black, 
African American, however you want to call yourself, you've heard the stories passed down through a family that we've got Indian blood in us. They swear to their grave, we've got Indian blood on it in us. And the answer is false. Book you want that it also again is listed on your handout, Black Indian Genealogy Research by Angela Walton Raji. And a lot of the features we we consider are deemed as Indian features actually are European features. And uh, Angela goes into great detail in this book. Next question. All black history courses are used to teach black people to hate white people. Now I know we have the advent, we've had the 1619 project, and we have a lot being circulated in the country right now. Uh, I think there's something called the critical race theory that everybody's butting up against. Um, and actually when I first taught this, I taught this course a couple of years at uh, the Ohio Genealogical Society, um, this lesson, I, I had this up on the screen before any of that came out. I was on the way to work one day. If you want to know the answer, the answer is false. I was on the way to work uh, one day and I had on what can, can be considered a considered, uh, conservative radio station here in the city. And I heard someone say this, you just know all black history courses are used to teach black people to hate white people. And that is totally, absolutely incorrect. Uh, if it's if it's taught right and taught in the proper perspective, it's about information that has been covered up and has not been revealed because of racism, uh, because of the way history courses have been taught, and it's just to 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 put everybody. On, we say everybody on a level playing field. Everybody, no matter what their DNA or RNA is in their ancestry, all of our descendants, all of us, no matter what color we are, have contributed immensely to the building of this country. Next question, I can, or statement, I can best learn African-American genealogy and history only from African-Americans. That's false. And there's my friend, J. Mark Lowe. I didn't know you were gonna join us, but there you are my friend, J. Mark Lowe, one of the outstanding genealogists in the country. Um, and has opened up her eyes to some avenues in African-American genealogy that I didn't even know about. The gentleman on the right, Theodore Cornweibel, brilliant um, historian out of San Diego, California. One of the books listed on your handout is the African-American, African I think called in the Railroad Experience. Phenomenal volume. And in that volume, it actually opened up the history and of African-Americans in the railroad industry and, and put some context to my great grandfather, my mother's side, David Gibbs, who was a fireman on the L&L Railroad. He has a section on just firemen and what they had to go through and, and experience of racism on top of working in, one, in, a, in a dangerous job as a fireman on the railroad. African-American genealogy 101 again, the next question, the civil rights movement started, look, look at the question, the civil rights movement started in 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. A lot of people point to that as the beginning of the civil rights movement. We say that's false. The indication when you say that question, and I didn't say the modern civil rights movement, I said the civil rights movement. The indication when you make that statement is that people of color who have been in this country since its inception before the, 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 the Declaration of Independence, were just satisfied with their lot in life here in the country, being second class citizens. And so here's a book, again in your handout, Pamphlets of Protest, an anthology of early African American protest literature. Look at the look at the time frames, 1790 to 1860. Richard Newman, Patrick Rail, Philip Lepsansky are the authors. There's they've been protesting since we have been on the North American content, continent. Statement, you must become a student of history to become a successful genealogist. True, you've got to be a student of history. I would say, especially if you're an African-American, you've got to know your history. And statement, African-American history is not for the squeamish. That's a quote from <coughs> Irvin L. Jordan. I don't know if we're relatives, but he's got a nice last name there. This is a picture from Young's Funeral Home in Walton County, Georgia. And it's showing the friends relatives viewing the bodies of four victims, the Morris Ford lynching, May Murray, Dorsey, George Dorsey, Dorothy Malcolm, or Roger Malcolm uh, down in Georgia. 
This is depicted in a book called The Fire and a Cane Break, The Last Mass Lynching by Laura Wexler. Uh, for our experience, we're gonna come across some things that are not easy and hard to swallow. And you have to figure out in your mind how could people in the name of humanity treat another person that way. But it's just part of the process. Um, and you gotta, you gotta brace yourself, but it's part of, again, putting our ancestors in context and the history of our people. This book, again, is also in your handout. Everything is on the internet, and everybody's a genius now. Everybody's on the internet and discovering their ancestors. False. Um, Dr. Abbott and um, we call it Dr. Lowe, can correct us. Mainly 75 to 85% of the information that is out there is not on the internet and familysearch.org, which I'll make a reference to later. Um, uh, genealogy, one of the premier genealogy websites um, is uh, the, they have volunteers indexing and also digitizing records for our access as well as ancestry.com. But again, um, everything is not on the internet. So if you're lazy, this genealogy is not for you. Dr. Abbott would say you're going to put your uh, uh, slippers on, take your slippers off and put your shoes on and go down to the courthouse and go down to the repositories and find the information you're looking for. So the most important card in your wallet is your library card. Because every good genealogist is a reader. I've refashioned uh, that bookcase since we've moved, but those are just some of the books uh, from the library in personal and my personal library that we have. So here's some things that I think you must have, you've got to have, or suggest you have out of all the resources that I list on your handout. These are some got to have. This one, I will say, if you don't get any other book, get Black Roots by Tony Burroughs, Beginner's Guide to Tracy, the African American Family Tree. The, one of the, he, my friend Tim Pinnock says he needs to update the book, and I think the last printing may have been in, oh, 2001, 2008. I'm not quite sure. Um, but it is the, the considered the Bible of African-American genealogy research. And one of the things that uh, Tony does, he has a plethora of resources in the back of his book, uh, websites, genealogical societies, African-American genealogical societies, uh, that is profound and you can follow up on um, when you're doing your research. So Black Roots by Tony Burroughs, Discovering Your African-American Ancestors by Franklin Carter Smith and Emily Ann Croom. The Source by letter Loretta Dennis, I think Sooks, I think the name, I pronounce the name is Sandra Hargraves Lukeen. There are different editions of this. So this is the third edition. And in that particular, uh, 1997, the source, chapter 15, has a chapter of Tracking African-American Family History by David T. Thackeray. But a later edition in 2006, uh, chapter 14, is African-American Research Principles by Tony Burroughs. Finding a Place Called Home by D. Palmer Wittor. Again, these books are in your, so you, so you don't get writer's cramp. These books are in your handout. Finding a Place Called Home, a Guide to African-American Genealogy and Historical Identity. I think she's deceased now. And um, Kenyatta Berry, who I believe she was the host of the Genealogy Road, so I'm not sure if she still is or currently there, but the uh, book came out about three years ago, The Family Tree Toolkit, very val valuable resource. The Black Family and Slavery and Freedom, 1750 to 1925 by Herbert J. Goodman, uh, uh, obliterates a lot of the myths concerning slaves, the Black family and slavery and afterwards some of the mis misconceptions we have that can hinder us in our genealogy res research. My friend Tim Pinnock out of Wilmington, North Carolina, finding and using African-American newspapers. Um, I agree with him that one of the keys to gen doing African-American genealogy research is finding and, and using, again, African-American newspapers. I found that to be a, a wonderful source. We have listed in the handout um, some websites for you to uh, access in terms of newspaper research. But Tim Pinnock, uh, he's like me, he's a book guy. Um, so, so if you ask me something, I'll refer you to a book before I refer you to anything else. And something to remember, this is Mr. Alex Haley, The Saga of an American Family. If anybody was, I guess everybody, hopefully everybody is old enough to remember 
when Roots was published and came out in a, a, a television series, 76, 77, those Roots and the Roots of the Next Generations. Mr. Haley's work has been critiqued by some of the <coughs> profoundest preeminent genealogists in the country and their question um, his citations and his sources. Um, but if you want to be, at least say sh shoot and be 100, Mr. Haley is primarily responsible for many, not just in the African American community, American community most of us in the African American community, even pursuing and wanting to know about our ancestry. <coughs> Genealogy in the past was maybe considered uh, for those for the elite, you've heard the term heraldry, you know, we're, we're researching your ancestors, and he brought it down to the common man. There's a book that if you want to evaluate his work and his life, Alex Haley and the Books That Change the Nation by Robert J. Norrell gives a very uh, balanced uh, look at his books. Uh, he also wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X, which if you find interesting is the best book I have read after the Bible didn't want to make me change and become a member of the Fruit of Islam, but it gave me perspective on why people believe what they believe. And again, a reaction to racism. All right, so here's basic genealogy, getting off to a good start. You want to start with yourself. Somebody says, might say, prove yourself. You want to start with yourself. Write everything you know about yourself and write everything down that you can remember. And you may think some things are not uh, important or uh, don't mean anything, but it is amazing how the minutest detail that you can remember from your childhood or being around your ancestors or being around people that hung around your ancestors, you might be surprised how that could lead to a clue that can break down what we call the genealogical community, a brick wall. So interview your relatives, oral history. This might be the most important thing to do when you get started. You want to make a list of all the relatives you have, living, young, old, especially get to those oldest relatives. You saw at the top of this presentation, we, my wife lost three aunts in their 90s within a space of four months. And again, I was fortunate to get to them and talk to them while their minds were fresh. My book, Double Jordan, is a not a perfect book, but it is a, I call a miracle book. Many of the people I interviewed for that book and mentioned in the book have died over the last 13 years and five years since I left the book. And the Lord opened the door for me able to, to communicate with them and connect with them and to get information with them. And I've been privileged that I had a lot of relatives. There have been a few here and there, but many of the relatives who I interviewed were willing to submit, give me, give me information and not question my motives. I've gotten pictures from people that I never thought uh, I, had, I, I would get, I ever seen before. Just recently in the last year, I uh, made a connection with my grandfather's side. Someone um, connected with me uh, through an ancestry message board and uh, just sent me pictures, uh, siblings of my great, great, uh, my great grandmother. Look for what is in your house. My mother's on here and the other, my bailiwick, so to speak, is dissecting death notices and obituaries. My mother, she, she jokes about it now. She says when, she, when she's gone, y'all can throw all this stuff away. My mother keeps everything. And I inherited that from her. Um, and so one of the things you want to look for are funeral programs, obituaries, newspaper articles, uh, anything you can find in your house. I think Tony Burroughs uh, mentioned a trunk uh, that belonged to his relatives. And he opened up that trunk, and it was a plethora of material uh, badges, ID cards, driver's license, mementos in that box. So look for what is in your house and your relative's house. See what has already been documented. I have been the, uh, uh, I profited off what people have already documented and shared with us and were willing to put down in writing. Research the history of the county and state your ancestors and relatives lived in. Very important. Our, we think our ancestors were mobile and stayed put back during that area during that era but uh they were they were on the go and they moved and you know our ancestors when they were emancipated did not necessarily stay in the community where they live um and that brings up research what the laws were regarding people of color in the county and state your ancestor and relatives lived in i have a uh, book I'll, i 
if I don't have it up on the slide here, it's mentioned in your handout called Black Codes. I don't know if many people realize that Ohio was one vote away from being a slave state. And even after that, Ohio had black codes were re which regulated the lives of African Americans in a so-called free state, yes, in the state of Ohio, and also throughout the country. There's a lady named Pauli Murray, uh, blessed her works in the uh, handout. She documented what the laws were regarding African Americans during the time frame which she lived and the laws that governed them. So those, there's a lady named Judy Russell. She's a legal genealogist. You need to lead, know the legal standing of African Americans in the state and city and the county in which you're searching for your ancestors, researching your ancestors. You wanna look for vital records. You look for marriage, uh, vital records of marriage, uh, birth, death records, and I'm gonna throw in divorce records. My nephew was here over the uh, week because one of the funerals this week was a, a, a memorial service for his father. And we were downstairs um, and he asked me for some information. I, I went to my files and I actually pulled out the divorce proceedings for a relative. And he was turning with his eyes open because in those divorce proceedings are some of the juiciest, uh, salacious material you'd ever want to read and explains uh, who, what, why, and where, or why the divorce took place. And if you're going to, I tell you, if you're going to the repository in your county that has the divorce record, you wanna pay attention to the number. I know here in Hamilton County, there's a number, two numbers on the right side of the page that they will mark. Usually if you just ask for the divorce decree, you're gonna get one or two or three pages, but look for a number which is usually under the, the, the line and that will be the total number of pages in the packet that you want everything in that packet because in that packet, along with the juicy details, might list some relatives that you need to be searching for. And after you have done all that, you wanna search the US federal census. Do all your groundwork first before you search the US federal census. <clears throat> so this is my friend, Tony Burroughs. He's actually added another phase in here, which is kind of dropped a drop down off of one of these, but this is from the book, Black Roots, Six Phases of African-American Genealogy. So once again, gather oral history and family records, get to those relatives, uh, find those records. You wanna research the family to 1870. And the reason you wanna research them to 1870, because the 1870 federal census is the first census in which people who were enslaved before the Emancipation Proclamation appear on the census record, okay? The, they're also, they understand there are also state censuses, which s some states have that you want to look into. That's kind of like on the, uh, we say the, the, the intermediate, uh, intermediate advanced stage, but I'll just let you know there are state censuses. And once again, you've got to know whether your family member was a free person of color or a slave as you approach the 1870 census. You wanna identify the last slave owner, okay? Identify the last slave owner, uh, research the slave owner and slavery. Do all the, find out all that you can about slavery, the nuances, the intricacies. And then you wanna go back to Africa. I think that's everybody's goal. And you wanna research Canada and the Caribbean. A friend of mine made a statement to me concerning a parishioner at his church, a fellow pastor. And the person made the statement to him that he didn't consider, he was from Jamaica, he didn't consider himself African American. He just considered himself American. And I can see where this is going. I didn't say anything. But this person had disassociated himself from the fact in the Atlantic slave trade, not only were slaves being brought to the North American continent in terms of what became the United States of America. We had slavery in South America and slavery in the Caribbean and, and part, part, Haiti, Jamaica, one of the biggest revolutions and protests is the Haitian revolution, uh, which was about 1789 to maybe 1804. Uh, Sinke, you may have heard him in the movie Amistad, uh, which, which is what the movie was about. But so you, so and the point I'm making is you have some relatives if you have African American descent or African descent, you have relatives somewhere in South America and Jamaica that you don't even know about because of the devastation of the Atlantic slave trade. Keep that in mind. So remember, 
<clears throat> Dr. Abbott will say, amen, a double amen, follow the process. If you skip any of these steps, it's going to hurt you in your research. Everybody's trying to climb back. And really what people are doing is name gathering and not doing genealogy research. Everybody's trying to reach back and find a slave owner. And I'll talk about this in a little bit, Kunta Kente. But if you skip the processes, which I just laid out for you, which are also in your handout, you're going to miss something. You got to go slow. Impatience is the enemy of any, any genealogist. So here's some important time frames. Slavery, 1619, 1865. The Civil War, 1861 to 1865. Reconstruction, <coughs> 1865 to 1877. Um, Jim Crow, segregation, 1877 to 1970. World War I, 1917 to 1918. And understand this, that people of color have participated in every major battle and conflict in the United States. The Great Migration, 1915 to 1970, they're considered two part portions of that, 1915 to 1930, and then 1940 to 1970. Notice these are centered around the two major world wars. Gail Buckley, who is the daughter of um, um, Lena Horn, her book is listed on their uh, handout. She does a phenomenal job on documenting African Americans in the wars. So the Great Migration, and I also mentioned Isabel Wilkerson, The Warmth of Other Sons, phenomenal book of the Great Migration, also in your handout. World War II, 1941 to 1945, and the Civil Rights Movement, as we, or we can correct ourselves and say the modern Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1968, and some will say that is that is still ongoing. So here's the point. Many traditional genealogical records, when you're researching, will be segregated by race. In many locations, there were separate docket books, and in some county courthouses, there were even separate rooms still in existence today to house white and colored records. Sometimes African Americans were deliberately kept out of rec records entirely. And during segregation, white genealogists figured they were not related to African Americans and therefore purposely omitted their names. When online, do not limit your search by race. Just, just take the, the they'll, they'll give you uh, the opportunity if you're on the search engine like uh, uh, Ancestry.com or Family Search, <coughs> possibly. They will ask you about the race of the person. Don't put a race in, just put the name in and you will be surprised. You will broaden your scope and finding your ancestor. And I will talk about the complexities of race um, on that issue here in a few minutes. Oftentimes, individuals were misidentified because of appearance, light, or fair skin. Some African Americans passed as white. And so you need to understand the complexities also on the dynamics, even among dark skinned and fair or considered light skinned African Americans. There's a book, I told you I got some books, Chosen Exile, A History of Racial Passing in American Life by Allison Hobbs. Phenomenal book. In your handout, with the explosion of DNA testing, we are learning that what we already knew, there are more biological blood ties between the races than were openly acknowledged. Individuals misidentified as white on an index, but correctly identified as black, colored, or Negro on an original document. I've, I've had that happen. Um, the indexing on certain genealogical websites is better than others. Uh, I think uh, that uh, Family Search is better indexing to Ancestry.com. That's my personal opinion. Uh, but you, th that's why you want to look for the original document as close as you can get to the original document, because the index will have butchered up your name, butchered up the person's name, and also the the racial identity. And when you click on the original document, you'll see that they weren't white; they were black has happened several times. So here's some terms for African-Americans when you're doing your research. African, African-American, Afro-American, Black, colored, freedmen, <coughs> free person of color, mulatto, Negro, 
Negress. Yes, we've had we've seen all of these in records. Octoroon, Quadroon. There is a book in your handout. One drop of black blood. Um, because the 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 general consensus one, if you had one drop of blood in you, one drop of we consider Negro a black blood in you. You consider it black. So these are where these terms come from. You're going to see slave. You're going to see wench. You're going to see that bad word at the top of the page. Yes, I have seen that on documents plenty of times. Bright or light skin. And the two terms, yellow and copper, uh, I heard in a military genealogy presentation that people of African, African descent were designated as yellow or copper. <coughs> Some abbreviations, B for black, C, color, C-O-L, color. C-O-L apostrophe D, C-O-L little D, C-O-L-D, colored. E-D, colored. F-P-C, free person of color, N, Negro, and the asterisk there denoting color, which will I'll show you an example in the city directory. Here is a declaration of marriage for Negroes and mulattoes. This is the, uh, the, a bond, a marriage bond, which I found unique. I think Dr. Everett will uh, attest, I have found unique in Kentucky. Uh, but there's a marriage bond, there's the intention, the declaration of the couple, the intention to get married. This is the marriage bond from my wife's great, great grandparents, <coughs> William Durham and Mariah Crawford, Isle, Boyle County, Kentucky, which was a region of Danville, Kentucky, which again, I said my mother's, my wife's paternal grand mother is from. When I went to search for this record, the uh, person I was talking to on the phone came back to the phone. She said, and she, and she had the awareness to ask me, were they black or white? And I said, they were black. So in that repository, the, how the records must have been situated, they must have been situated in a way different shape, different shape, Negroes and mulattoes and Negroes and and white or black and white, and she found it for me. So you gotta be cognizant of that. And you gotta be sp specific and know there's some questions you're gonna have to ask uh, when you're asking people for records from the repositories. It is your, in your best interest to build up because you can't stay at home and do genealogy research. It is in your best interest to put your shoes on and while you're going to the repositories, build relationships with these people. So when they know what, when you're coming, they don't think you're kook and know what you're talking about. You build relationships with these people and you make the process go quicker. So that's a marriage bond. But notice at the top, the designation is Negroes Mulattoes. And the only way that she found this, she went to the section where I would say colored or black marriage records were stored. This is a 1907 city directory from Pensacola, Florida, where my great, my, my grandmother and great, great, my great grandparents on my mother's side resided. They're found in the 1900 census. There's something called a city directory. Sometimes they are known as census substitutes. The federal census comes out every two, 10 years. In addition, there are state censuses that come out and you have to you do the research in the state to see if those censuses are available. But here in the city directory in 1907, Pensacola, Florida, you see my family. Now, I don't know if this, this Burton Gibbs is a relative, but you see the asterisk, and the asterisk there is to note that the person is black or colored, all right? And you see my, grand, my grandmother's, my mother's mother listed there. She's a laundress, um, and she resides. Uh, and was, now this is saying she boarded at 420 Davis Street, Davis Street in Pensacola, Florida. She's a laundress. A couple things here. This is my grandmother's, my grandmother's original name was Clora, but she, named, she changed it to Flora. This validates the oral history that my mother told me, even though the name is spelled wrong here, Clara, that she, her original name was Clora, and it is even on the 1900 census, all right? So you get some information here about where she lived at, what her occupation was, and the gentleman below her is David Gibbs, who was a fireman. That's my great-grandfather residing at the same residence, and 
B would be Border 420 Davis. In other words, they were living with my great grandfather, David Gibbs Jr., who actually died in 1918 in Lima, Ohio. And the lady right below that, Rachel Gibbs, I am assuming, I have made the assumption and come to the conclusion that it is that is my great grandfather's second wife, Rachel. But the point here is notice the asterisk to designate that they are people of color. This is a marriage record from my father, Richard Jordan Sr., and his first bride, Mary Edith Wiley. She would say Mary Edith Wiley, Jordan Tompkins. Um, I, in the genealogy, she, she is my stepmother, and unfortunately, she passed away suddenly in December of this past year. But this is their marriage record. There's a, there's a, there's the marriage return, that says, which, which is returned, which you, which you do on file at the courthouse, and then me being a clergyman, there's, a, there's another portion that I have to send back to validate that the ceremony has taken place. So this is a record at the, the Hamilton County Courthouse. And notice at the top where the arrow says, this is in Cincinnati, Hamilton County, free state of Ohio. And at the top, COL stands for colored. So in the couple was colored. This is a World War I draft registration card. Um, one of the books listed in your handout is a book called Uncle We Are Ready. Goes into exploration of the entire process for the uh, and, 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 and the World War I draft registration and the cards. Notice on the corner on the bottom left, this is my grandmother's uncle, my great uncle Esau Gibbs, um, and gives information about him, born in Pensacola, Florida. My uncle has four different birth dates I found, but here he's listed as being born in 1895. But the point on this document is at the corner, you see the corner is torn off. <clears throat> and this is in the first round. There were three separate drafts during this war. Um, and the, this is the designate that he's a person of color. The corner is being torn off. That's on the right hand corner. You see uh, on, the, on, the, on the right is a designate that there are people of color. Those are things that you want to look out for when you're researching your ancestors. This is the Mississippi enumeration of educable children from the, from also found on familysearch.org and the Mississippi Department of Ag uh, Archives and History. Um, just hopping on family search, popping in names of relatives um, and uh, the, the relatives listed on this page. But I want you to notice the designation at the top. You see the arrow uh, when they, the, the enumeration district where the school was located, list of educable, educable children in the African-American community, mulatto Negroes. Yes, it is in our document. And sad to say, I have found that bad word on the top of one of these documents. Maybe the guy was having a bad day or it, what was that name came out, but he did list that term on an official document. Again, if you're doing Macro-American history, you can't be squeamish. You got to brace yourself for what you're going to see. Uh, African-American uh, newspaper research. When you're doing newspaper research, um, there are sections of the um, uh, community newspaper that will be designated for black news. This is a Meridian Star out of my mother's hometown of Meridian, Mississippi. Just an example. Um, um, black news. It's a section for black news. You will, you will find a plethora of uh, uh, nuggets and information in these social columns that a lot of times appear in the news, newspapers, and especially in the, in the black section. This is from the Macon Telegraph, the colored news. From the Macon Telegraph, I found this at the Washington Memorial Library in Macon, Georgia. And the, again, a good librarian had the sense to tell me, do you know that there was a section in the newspaper called Colored News. Why well, didn't know that? I just thought all the news was in the paper, but there was a section for Colored News. The gentlemen listed here are the bro these are obituaries uh, for the brothers of my great grandfather, Felix Jordan Sr., Albert Jordan and Alan Jordan, uh, found um, in the Colored News section of the Macon Telegraph. This is the funeral program of my grandfather, Willie Jordan, my paternal grandfather. And the funeral program in the African-American community is a big deal. And again, having been a clergyman, um, I didn't really, I noticed this, but I never really thought about it until I, I, I started doing African-American genealogy research. Uh, it is believed because a lot of times we were not included in, 
in many cities, we were not included in mainstream newspapers, or obituaries, or death notices when our relatives died. That the African American funeral program became it was a, came out of that. Um, her name is Cheatham. I'm forgetting the first name, uh, but she she mentions that it was an outgrowth and a, and a way of celebrating her ancestors. So this is kind of on the low key side. I've come and seen them in triple. Uh, triple fold, multi fold booklets, we celebrate our ancestors. And it is in these funeral programs, which my mother was a, a, a master of keeping and collecting and I have done the same. One of the presentations I do is the uh, how to pick apart a death notice and obituary. And here you go. Um, I was able to extract from this uh, information on my family and several obituaries, um, information on my family to construct my family tree. And then there's a green book. Master Mark Lowe presented about the Green Book in one of his genealogy presentations. This was distributed to African Americans who were traveling because we were around the country where we were prohibited from lodging in many areas, especially south of the Mason Dixon line, or eating at establishments south of the Mason Dixon line. I will say north also. North sometimes gets a pass, but about in a lot of ways just as bad. And this is a book. Actually, I found this, notice this book at our own here at Beecher Stowe House in the library, Overground Railroad, The Green Book and the Roots of Black Travel in America by Candace C. Taylor. Phenomenal book. She traveled to all the places listed in these green books and documented them. Uh, there's a section here in Cincinnati, the Walnut Hills area, Evanston area, Walnut Hills, uh, around Chapel Street where my grandparents lived. And one of the places was the Mans Hotel, um, which was the place where African Americans who couldn't find lodging, other hotels lodged at the Man's Hotel, and it is mentioned in the Overground Railroad book by Candace e. Taylor. Okay, uh, slave, so, so this is what everybody wants to get to, slave research. Everybody's wanting to find a slave owner. I want to find a slave owner. I want to know who owned, I'm quite honest with you, there's a part of me that wonders why it's such a phenomenon. Why well, I want to find a slave owner, but I'll explain that in a minute. But here's a personal word of exhortation and caution. This is what I call avoiding the Kunta Kinte syndrome. Kunta Kinte, the ancestor of Alex Haley. Oftentimes in the zeal to prove our connection to Africa, the homeland, or find that elusive pre-slavery ancestor and now slave owner, we miss a plethora of opportunities to learn about the achievements of our family and their associates in the modern era. This is, this, I don't know if anybody recognizes this young lady. She's really famous in African-American history and what we consider the modern civil rights movement. This is a booking photo of Joanne Gibson Robinson for being arrested during the Montgomery bus boycott. Joanne Gibson Robinson is on my paternal side, my first cousin, twice removed. This is her book, The Montgomery Bus Boycott and the Woman Who Started It, the memoir of Joanne Gibson Robinson. Joanne Gibson Robinson's mother, Dolly Webb Gibson, and my great grandmother, Ella Webb Jordan, were sisters, one of 11 kids who survived to adulthood. And the only reason I found out about her, her, because I was down in Georgia one year and I found the cemetery, actually a cousin of mine located the cemetery and led me to the, took me to the cemetery where my ancestors on my grandmother's side, her, her mother's side, Ella Webb, were buried. There's a section of the cemetery where all the webs are buried. And in that cemetery was a gentleman, I, I didn't recognize the name, his name was Clifford Webb. Well, I went home, did my, got online, doing a research, trying to find out who this Clifford Webb was. And when I searched in Georgia, didn't find anything pertaining to a Clifford Webb. <clears throat> when I took off the area where he died and just left the, left the name and the parameter, birth date and the death of, date, death of his death date, all of a sudden these hips came up for this Clifford Webb online. And it turned out Clifford Webb, it was a cousin of mine whose 
grandfather, Martin Van Buren Webb, was my great grandmother's brother. And he died in the DC area, Maryland area. And I was able to contact his wife, Jackie Gales Webb, who actually, at the, on today's Sunday, she hosted a radio program for the Howard University campus. And also she's on Sirius Radio. And she's also on the, one of the board members of the Smithsonian Institute, one of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. Led me to his wife. And I also got a contact with his mother, June Hargrave Webb, who fortunately also she died last year, the tender age of 95. And again, they, I reached out to them with a letter. They contacted me and it was Jackie Gills Webb who told me about Joanne Gibson Robinson. But again, doing, going through the process, not going fast, I found out information about a relative, a famous relative, who if you are aware of Eyes and the Prize documentary, Eyes and the Prize 1 and 2, the first episode of Eyes and the Prize 1, produced by Henry Hamp Hampton and Blackside, on that video, and I was showing my granddaughter last week, is Joanne Gibson Robinson residing in Los Angeles, California, and talking about her part in the Montgomery bus boycott when she, uh, she distributed 30, I think about 35,000 leaflets uh, talk, talking about the plan to protest and prepare for the boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. She's one of the unsung heroes. There is a display of her at the African American Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. Again, not rushing to have the coup to Kente syndrome, I found out about a relative that I would have never known because I slowed down the process. Uh, this is my granddaughter Imani's, and I'm coming to a close here shortly. My granddaughter Imani's class project, uh, family culture interview, and one of the devastations of slavery is, you know, you, you hear you, if you hear uh, Malcolm X and excerpts of him speaking. He'll, he'll make, he'll make a statement, a robbing us of our land and robbing us of our language and robbing us of our culture. So Imani sat down, she's a burgeoning genealogist, and she asked Papa some questions about her family. One of the questions is, what country did our family come from and when? I gave her an answer, which is not correct, really, because Africa is not a country, it's a continent. One of those myths we need to bust. There are countries on the continent of Africa. <clears throat> she also asked, uh, what language did they speak? And I had to say, I don't know. What religion did they follow? I have to say, I don't know. I, what, I know what we practiced after coming over here, but I don't know. Uh, what foods did they eat? Well, we can sort of kind of surmise, if we do a historical research in the continent of Africa and what was practiced there, we can, we can come up with some African dishes and African restaurants, but in terms of stuff that has passed down to the family that actually came from an ancestor from Africa, I don't know. Uh, what clothes did they wear? <coughs> Again, we can do research and see what they wore in Africa, but in terms of something being transmitted orally, exactly what they wore, I don't know. Tell me about uh, our special holidays and traditions, and that I, I could give her some more information on. The point is here, this speaks to the devastation of slavery. Other individuals are able to pinpoint their ancestors' entry into this country through Ellis Island, and it is on books. Those of us who are African descent our, most of our ancestors, if not all of our ancestors, came through, came over here on a boat if they made it through the Atlantic slave trade and across the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, amen, to the North American continent. And there's no record. And, and, and if you're amazing, if you're able to find the record of the slave ship and the slave holder, um, it is amazing. So the one again, those nuances and those differences in researching African-American history and genealogy and, and, and as opposed to the masses, all right? So slave research, remember this, not every person of color was a slave before the Emancipation Proclamation. Not every slave lived on a plantation, less than 15% of the slaves. I know we are gone with the wind and we got the idea of the plantation, but that is not uh, the, the norm. Um, not every former slave retained the name of the previous slave owner. 
when Channel 12 interviewed us for this uh, presentation on Wednesday, we mentioned the fact that our, our ancestors were a lot smarter than people gave them credit for. This is expounded on in the book by uh, Mr. Goodman, uh, Black uh, Freedom and, and, and Slavery, uh, where he mentions that most of our, a lot of our ancestors secretly had a surname because our, I'll show you in a, a document here in a minute had a cert did not have they did not have a surname given to them by the slave owner or they were known as uh, uh mr moore slave or they went by the surname of the slave but a lot of our slave our ancestors did not retain the, the name of the previous slave owner they may have retained the the surname or took the surname of a previous slave owner or someone they liked or someone in history um slaves were considered to be property that's going to affect our research. So when we're going back and we're researching to the slave owner, we got to remember, we got to look at estate documents, wills. I have a will of the slave owner. They owned my great, great grandmother on my, on my mother's side, my, my maternal grandfather's side. I have a copy of the will, which stretched out over several years, even after, um, um, because it was a probate court, and several years even after emancipation, but I have a copy of the will. I'll mention that here in a minute, but we, but we were we were property. You got it used to that, okay? They had insurance on slaves. There was a major insurance company out of Baltimore, Maryland, um, which the slaves uh, had the slave owners had insurance on their property. So you you look out for the key players in the slave owning community, not just by the surname that you have. All the major slave owners, slave owning key players in the slave owning community. All of them probably had something to do with transactions with your ancestor. You want to lead, utilize slave schedules? I'll show you a copy of that here in a second as I'm getting ready to round third and head for home like the old left-hander Joe Nuxall. You want to seek the inventory of slave owners. Um, here's a slave schedule. Ewell Webb, I am led to believe this is the gentleman that owned the Webb family still doing some sleuthing, but this is a slave schedule. If you're researching on Ancestry.com and, and FamilySearch.org, uh, uh, um, mainly Ancestry.com, will, you will see slave schedules, and they will give the name of the person. You got to watch this. It not only gives the name of the person who owned the slaves, but it, will, it might not be the person who owned the slaves. It might be the overseeing the slaves and they put his name down. So he owned about 125 slaves. <clears throat> no names on the slave schedule. List name of slave, owner, the age of the slave, sex and color of slave. This is 1860 slave schedule. Ask if the slave was manumitted or freed and if a fugitive, if he was a fugitive from the state, and I haven't encountered any concerning my relatives, but again, things to consider. And Dr. Abbott and Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark Lowe are smarter than I, and they can elaborate on that if need be. This is an inventory of Leroy Upshaw of Barber County, Alabama, Eufaula, Alabama, owner of, of great great grandfather. We say half siblings. I don't, we never use the term half siblings, but that's a genealogical term. So my Jordan siblings through their uh, grandfather, <coughs> Johnny Wiley. I found this on Percy, Percy, P-E-R-S-I, Periodical Resource Index. Um, and I found this and, and ordered a copy. And this is the appraisement of the estate of Leroy Upshaw, uh, uh, dated, I think it's December, Source Orphan Court Record Book. One page 279 to 280 in the probate court records out in Barbara County. Um, notice um, third line down, Doe means, it's just re repetition of Negro. One Negro man named Long Wyatt, the price on him was $1,000. There's a, there's a calculation you can make to, how, to see how much that would be in modern dollars. And then there's a one Doe or a Negro man named Short Wyatt. Now, I don't know me. That probably is an older Wyatt and a son named Wyatt. They got a long or short. He's valued at $900. But this is the inventory for the slave owner. Again, we were property. This is the inventory for the slave owner. All right. So this would be, if I said this, I think their great-great-grandfather 
Y is spelled Y A A T, but in other records it's spelled Y A T T. But you see him listed here. All right. Um, and last but not least, as I round this up and end, I think in a uh, decent amount of time, this is a facsimile, a copy of a letter written from a relative named Roxy Williams Sims. Um, she is a cousin of mine. Last I knew or anybody made me aware of her, she lived in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I believe she's deceased, but she took the time to write down in a letter the history on my maternal grandfather's side, dating back to my great grandmother, Betsy Williams Little Page, and the name of the slave owner, Betsy Little Page Williams. This is a transcription that my, one of my cousins in the 2006 reunion held here in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Martin Thomas reunion, she transcribed the letter. <coughs> now, I did not know that this letter had been circulated by other cousins in the family, and that's where she got it from. But to make a long story short, I took all the information on this letter and even the cousins, descendants off of, from my great-great-grandmother and the, her daughter, Roxy Cindy Brookins. And I was able to construct a family tree and, and records of, I blew up my family tree based off this letter. Last but not least, I made a timeline about um, on everything that was contained in this letter and I put it on my ancestry timeline. And anybody remember the movie, The Blues Brothers? Jake and Elwood Blues, the band, the, the light, the band, like light shining out of heaven. This document popped up on ancestry and it documented, according, just as the letter stated, Frances Anderson Wells. Her first married name was Little Page. She got married again, Wells. Um, she was the owner of my great great grandmother. I am still sorting through how the transaction was made, whether she, the, my great grandmother belonged to her husband and she inherited him. She inherited her and her, and her children. Uh, but in down in Meridian, Mississippi, on the other side of the state line, Meridian, Alabama, where Meridian and Lauderdale, Lauderdale County sits, is Choctaw County, Alabama. And that's where the slave owner resided. We drove, we were down there several years ago and there was a road somebody directed us to that led up to the cemetery where the little pages are <coughs> interred or buried, but the road was so muddy they, they advised us not to drive up there. But that's our headstone. She's a slave owner and we've documented her and a little, I don't know if a cousin of mine who I just connected with in Kansas City is on this a Zoom meeting. Uh, the, uh, the slave owner had a son named Robert Little Page and my grandmother's name was Viney Thomas. My grandfather's, my maternal grandfather's, Martin Thomas, his, her, his mother's name was Viney Thomas. Her sister's name was named Marvin Little Page Brookins. On her death certificate, she lists the name of her mother as Betsy, and she names the, her father as Robert Little Page. The only Robert Little Page I have seen on any documentation while I have been researching this family is the name of the slave owner's son. So it is, so we, so that it's not just a hunch, it's a very strong premonition that this Robert Little Page, and you can look at the, the complexion of the offspring of Marvine and her children, their fair complexion that he fathered. Uh, he may have been the, he may be, he may be, don't have any conclusion yet, he may be the, my great-great-grandfather, the son of the slave owner. And so that is it for <laughs> African American Genealogy 101. Two more books. This is a left side, Remember Slavery. It's a, a book with also cassette tapes um, that, that is listed in the handout. You will, it was phenomenal to listen. Uh, listen to the voices of those who were previously enslaved and the testimony in their account of being in slavery. And a book we picked up from our friend Tim Pinnock, Dictionary of African American Genealogy, Afro American Slavery, edited by Randall Miller and John David Smith. Um, some incredible resources if you're doing uh, history and research on African Americans in this country and in slavery. And so I thank you for putting up with me and thank you for listening. And I, I yield the floor back to. Uh, Christina 
and see what questions you have that I can answer or someone smarter than I can answer. All right, thank you, Thomas. Um, actually, if you want to stop the screen share, then we can see uh, people. You want to see me? We want to see people. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, and uh, I'm gonna have to figure out how to fix my screen so that I can see more people, but um, okay. All right, so, um, we did have a couple of questions that had come through. Abigail uh, found them for me. Okay. Um, first of all, you know, what is the best place or how do you find birth and death records? The best you place want, for that. Um, there is a, I'm looking at the book. There's a handy book for genealogists um, by Everton. And it's, I think it's a conjunction with uh, Ancestry.com. And there's also something called a red book. Also, on Family Search, they will let you know what the repositories are in the county where you can find marriage, birth, and death records. Uh, they call vital records. Um, here in Cincinnati, uh, downtown, like for death certificates, uh, they're on Elm Street. So you, so I will use those as resources. And like I said, FamilySearch.org, which is a free genealogy website, will let you know what the, the repository in the county that holds a birth, death, and marriage records. Marriage, uh, if you birth records, we we are so accustomed to having them, but they're really, in terms of the the age of the country, are are a recent phenomenon. So you want to know when the birth records were were mandated in the the state and the county as well as death certificates. Because if you search for a birth certificate and they were mandated, you're, you're gonna be maybe chasing a needle in a haystack. And that's why also family Bibles are important. If your relatives, uh, I just had a relative of mine the other day saying they left their mother's Bible because I'm doing research in their family because a lot of our family members documented, I know my mother-in-law documented births in the Bible. So, mm -hmm. but, you want to, but you want to search out in your, in your county that you live in, you want to uh, find out the repository where they're located at. Um, here, you know, since, you know, Ohio is uh, Columbus. Um, for some reason, down in Florida, I think it's Tallahassee. In Alabama's Montgomery. Um, so, at the state level, and that's where you can find the birth, birth, death, divorce records. And marriage records. Hopefully, hopefully I answered that correctly. <laughs> um, what about photos? How to find photos? Any well, good tips there. Um, a couple things. This is where, and I don't know where you're, how you're starting off. If you have a ton of relatives around you, um, my wife's aunt, that I mentioned at the top of the presentation, Goodney. Um, they were going, obviously with the funeral happening, they were going through all these pictures and all these pictures all of a sudden are popping up that no one knew she had. So that's why I'm asking everybody to do your due diligence first in approaching the living relatives. You will be surprised what a second or third or fourth cousin has that you never knew had. A lot of the pictures I have, it wasn't a aunt. <clears throat> or my mother, it was down the line and they were just willing to, to share. So you got to get over the hump. And if there's a cousin they've been talked to in years, you just got to get over the hump, ask them what they have. Sometimes when you're doing research, um, I'll, I'll give you an example in booklets. If you're doing your due diligence and you're reading and you're studying the county, you just might happen to find a relative, a picture of your relative in a book. I um, posted on my Facebook page several weeks ago that my grandchildren's grandmother passed away. One of her relatives was unwittingly a participant here in Cincinnati in the general radiation experiments at now University of Cincinnati Hospital, then known as General Hospital. The government did radiation experiments on cancer patients and maybe, uh, not maybe, they did uh, expose them to more radiation that they knew. Um, and so his name is James Tidwell. This is my grandchildren's great, 
great grandfather, their father didn't even know this. Ironically, there was a book called The Treatment that was written as a result of an investigation done by the TV station I used to work for. I say that because in that book, and I had read the book, but I had made no connection with my grandchildren's family. In that book are pictures <laughs> of her family, of their family in that book. Ancestry.com, if people are willing to do, willing to place pictures on them, you, when you, when you find people with matching trees, you may find trees that uh, people are willing to submit, submit pictures. I've um, got a ton of pictures uh, that way. Um, so you just, you just kind of do, do, do diligence, ask relatives. Um, you'd be surprised when we'll pop up in a magazine. Some of my relatives are Ebony Magazine, some old Ebony Magazine uh, 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 editions. So um, I hope, hope that's helpful. But first, start with the relatives, see what they have. And some of our parents haven't even shared what they have in their photo albums or in their closets. Mm -hmm. So you just have to ask. Great. Um, Another person asked, what has been your greatest discovery? And you've told us so many things that I don't know how you would pick, but what is your greatest discovery? What I shared with you about Joanne Gibson Robinson. Let's go back. Eyes and the Prize came out in 1987. Um, and I've watched, I don't know how many times I've watched Eyes and the Prize. Lo and behold, this lady who's talking about her part in the Montgomery bus boycott, that's my cousin. And she, again, she just didn't play a small part. She played a major part. She, the People think in the Montgomery bus boycott that Rosa Parks just happened to just one day just not refuse to give her seat to a white gentleman on the bus. But that had been in planning and in motion for, for a while. They were just looking for the right person for they able to, 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 to represent so to speak. And so the Montgomery Improvement Association, which she was a part of, she knew, this person knew Martin Luther King directly. Uh, and uh, Gray, the attorney down there, I've got relatives, my, and I'll add to this, next month, if I have the opportunity, and I'm filling up to it, I am going to go down to Georgia, because of the book, a professor down there got in contact with me trying to pinpoint her exact birth date. There are several birth dates. She was born in Culloden, Georgia, which is near Crawford County. They are erecting his historical marker in her honor for her birth in the city of Culloden. And so I had a cousin that I found in my genealogy research named Oscar Webb. I called her ambassador cousin. He's an ambassador to the goodwill of goodwill to the United Nations. He's in Chicago. He calls her Aunt Joanne. And he's been uh, over her, uh, been executor of a lot of her affairs, along with a cousin of mine out in California. And they got, got put him in contact with him. He got the thing done. I'm going down there next month to see their historical marker erected. But that by far, out of all that I have discovered, to me, that is the most personal, most rewarding. And to see her at the Smithsonian, African American Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., make sure, make sure you uh, stick your chest out, poke your chest out a little bit. <laughs> So we've had some positive comments about how phenomenal this talk has been. Uh, but then also um, <clears throat> playing off of one of the things that you said earlier, um, J. Mark Lowe comments that most state archives and historical societies have made digital photo collections available, but they, there are others that are not digitized, including Ohio history. So, uh, you know, it's kind of hit or miss in terms of some of the things that are available from state archives and historical societies in terms of photograph. Can, uh, can, you, can you repeat that? Because you were breaking up a little bit on me there. Oh, sorry. Um, so, <clears throat> Mr. Lowe says, most state archives and historical societies have made some digital collections, photo collections available, uh, but others, including Ohio history, has not. So it's kind of hit or miss in terms of uh, mm -hmm. whether state archives do have some digital photographs. Mark Lowe's a man. Thank you, Mark. Um, and this is a, a more specific question. Um, CB says, I have an African-American relative that passed away in 1918 at the age of 26, who was a railroad fireman in South Carolina. So any ideas on where to look to see if they have, uh, to see any personnel or other records exist for him through the railroad? Nothing seems to be on the railroad board website. Does she, do, 
I want to ask if you know particular what railroad they work for. And some railroads have documentation. Um, they're, they're, I was looking for this concerning my great grandfather, L and L Railroad, uh, Louisville and Nashville Railroad. Um, I am I've been made aware because of a presentation that I attended that there are railroads that I have have kept documentation of employees. Um, you just get get it again, uh, as Mark said, the, wherever you're located or wherever your relatives are located, seek out the genealogical society down there, historical society, and see what they have available. And, he, and again, you research the, the, research the history of the railroad and see what documentation they have. Some websites have been created for certain railroads um, and they will let you, let you know what documentation they have and then the records they have. Um, on death certificates, my, grand, my wife's great uncle, Silas Durham, work for the railroad industry. And if you're on Ancestry or FamilySearch.org and you see on the death index, they will mention that they worked for um, the railroad. And so that, again, that leads to, you know, other exploration. Uh, again, um, maybe on a social security application, um, SS5, when they, apply for the social security, they will list who they work for and they will they list the railroad. So different avenues, again, trying to find specifically which railroad they work for, if that railroad uh, company is still in existence or they have uh, produced any records that they have on file in their archives. So a number of ways to approach that. And then like I said, Deborah and um, Dr. Abbott, the queen as we call her and Mark on here, they may have some other insight on that. Okay, so that, is there he is. The mark responded. <laughs> look at the community, see what railroads serve that community, and then that mm -hmm. will help you narrow it down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are, oh, wait, here we go. Um, and there's also more advice here. Um, okay. in, Ohio, but, the, in Ohio, vital records began in 1908 and can be obtained from the Vital Statistic Office in Columbus. Uh, prior to 1908, it's going to be found in the counties. So that's just a little bit more information in terms Told you of Ohio records. Yeah, um, um, I don't have any more questions written in the chat, uh, but if anyone has questions and they want to unmute themselves and ask it directly, that would be fine too. I was just going to say... Uh, Is that Gina? Go ahead, Gina. Mama Gina. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Great job, Thomas. I, I, I heard part of it, but I was just going to say about UC. I used to work at UC and I did public relations for the libraries. And right now, uh, the University of Cincinnati is the state depository for Hamilton County. So you can find birth and death records. Just go to uc.edu and put in digital library, and it actually has a card for each person born after a certain year. Any, any, um, um, what's the word? Will, last will and testament of anyone who, uh, uh, who had a will in Hamilton County before a certain year is also the actual physical will and certain documents are at UC Archives and Rare Books Library, but you can get it through the digital library online. Uh, when I worked there, I was just fiddling around one day and I found the actual will for Levi Coffin. Mm -hmm. And from that will for Levi Coffin, that was able to be digitized and I sent a copy to the Levi Coffin house in Indiana. So you'd be amazed, you'll find your own relatives' wills right there at the University of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Gina. Anyone else have additional questions for Thomas? Christina, I mentioned again on my handout, I, I compiled a list, it's not an exhaustive list of who's who in African-American genealogy. That was provided by her, she's currently a vice president of our genealogy group, but she's also in Indiana, Judith Casey. Um, and also who, who in genealogy period and Mark and Dr. Abbott are, uh, are on those two handouts. So those are, again, it helps to have people smarter than you are. I've learned from them and um, those are resources. Now, Dr. Abbott, I'm messing with her. She's not on Facebook, but she's, 
he's pretty accessible. And um, this, uh, and, and you go to these conferences and and uh, workshops. And you know, last year with Zoom, everything being online, it's it's amazing the amount of material that is out there. Uh, people... Maybe Dr. Abbott will teach a class for the show house. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this. Uh, thank you, Gina, about the University of Cincinnati. I had just put that in the chat and that the, that those records are mm -hmm. for, for Hamilton County are at the oh, university. I didn't see that. Yeah, I put it in the chat that they are at the uh, University of Cincinnati and the Cincinnati Genealogical Society has published a book of those records. So you would be able to, to look through there and see what, what's there. It's in a series, mm -hmm. but that exists. And so having it digital makes it even even better. But uh, I was, I'm the one that was talking about Ohio itself in that we didn't start keeping those records till 1908. <laughs> and um, so uh, of course you can get them. You know, we don't have any restrictions on who can have those records and, and who can't, but um, if you want something prior to 1908, you need to check the counties. You won't see a certificate like we're used to, because as Thomas said, that's more modern day. You will, you will find a ledger usually in the county and not a certificate that we are used to looking at. And, you, and it will depend on the county how far back they'll keep it. But maybe I've seen some going back to like 1867 or something like that. But all counties don't have that. Um, they may not go back that far. But normally, if I don't find 1908, then I will check, check the um, counties. And then again, and Thomas mentioned this too, Family Search. Uh, has what I call a research guide, and you find it under the tab that says Wiki. So if you look at the Family Search Wiki, you will see there when vital records started, and you will also see the names of the repositories for the areas that you're researching. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so we, we do have another question, and that says, how different would it be to do research or to research the history of a neighborhood? I don't think difficult. A lot of neighborhoods have community news, newspapers. Um, I was at a story of the day, um, and I looked, I think, I, maybe it was Easter, yeah, I said Easter Hills Journal. You know, there's not only your main newspapers, but there are community newspapers. And again, you, you need to check with the repositories in, a, in the city you live in. Um, I, I think the library is underutilized, is considered a dinosaur. But you need to check with the, uh, you know, check with your library, check with the historical society, genealogical society, um, and see what they have. Uh, I remember one year I was looking for a death notice, an obituary for a relative, and the library referred me to the genealogical society. And the genealogical society, with the library didn't have it, the genealogical society had it. So again, I mentioned Tony Burrow's book. Um, he, he, he lists repositories and you just got to familiarize yourself, uh, with your city. You got to know your city. Some of us live in a city, don't know our city and we've got a great city. We've got one of the best library systems here in the country. Whenever you do genealogical research, Cincinnati is always listed yep. Usually on the top 10 or 15 is one of the best libraries here in the city. And Tony Burroughs helped build up the, um, African American library section of the Cincinnati Library. There's Dr. Abbott. There's a queen. <laughs> what? <laughs> what I do? I saw you pop up. You got something to add? Oh, no, I'm okay. I'm just sending you sending a little note, but I'm fine. Bless you. So, um, Mr. Lowe also says use deeds, court records, manuscripts, and other government records. So those are also ways to, to look at not only family history, but also neighborhood history, et cetera. All right. Any other questions? It's, we have had so much fun and it's already 5.30, mm -hmm. but uh, I will entertain any additional questions before we sign off. Everybody, I hate, to, I hate to brag. Does anybody know who Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is? <laughs> 
<laughs> you mean anybody, Lou Alcindor? Lou Alcindor? Lou Alcindor. And does anybody <laughs> know who Queen Elizabeth is? <laughs> having Dr. Abbott and J. Mark Lowe on here is like having Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Queen Elizabeth on this. Y'all just don't know. If you sit in one of their lectures and workshops, you'll find out. <laughs> Low and Abbott. All right. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, Thomas, definitely, I want to say thank you for this phenomenal presentation. Uh, I think a lot of people are really excited and happy that they got to join in. And we're going to have to do something similar again um, in the future. But um, just on behalf of the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, I want to thank everyone for coming today. And remember to check out our website for additional uh, discussion groups and lectures and presentations. And then don't forget the birthday party, which is on June 13th. June 13th, one to four. And uh, thank you all. I will, um, I will stick around for just another minute or two in case anybody has any questions for me. But uh, have a good afternoon and uh, just let's, one last round of applause for Mr. Jordan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.